All right, in this video, I'm going to be talking to you about limits, and this is the first lesson of Calculus BC. Okay, so this is really the definition of a limit. We're really just getting going. Okay, and so you know, the first question I've got for you is you're looking at this graph of a function f of x, and my question for you is, what's the value of f of 1? And if you're thinking the value of f of 1 is 5, then, then you would be correct, okay? It's f of 1 is equal to 5 because that's where I'm seeing the filled in circle, okay? That means that's where the graph is, that's the height of the graph at x equals 1, that's what it means to consider f of 1, okay? Now, suppose I asked you, what is happening to the function as x gets closer to 1 as it's approaching, say, from the left? And the notation we're going to use for this is, you know, x is approaching 1 from the left, we'll say from the negative side, like as if the negative is an exponent. Okay, what's happening to f of x? We're considering the limit, the one-sided limit. And in this class, one-sided limit does not come with a definition. You, it's just it's intuitive, I guess. And, but as we're approaching 1 from the left, I use gray to kind of show you what's happening. We're, you know, getting closer and closer to y is equal to 2. Okay, so I'm going to say that that limit as x approaches 1 from the negative side of f of x is equal to 2. If I was to instead ask you about what was happening as f of x approached 1 from the right, from the positive side, well, something very different is happening there because I've got really two pieces of graph. Okay. And, you know, as I'm approaching 1 from the right side in x, what's happening on the graph? Well, y is getting closer and closer to 5. So I'm going to write in, I'm going to think that that's, that limit is 5. Okay. And so, you know, Really, I think the thing I need you to know right now is that, you know, that is from the left. And then the from the positive side necessarily means from the right. Let's see, that's from the right. And now the definition, because most of the limits you're going to see in this course are not going to have the negative or the positive attached to them. We're not going to consider one-sided limits, right? We're going to just consider limits of f of x as x approaches some x value. So here, let's keep... Right, so we're going to say that the limit as x approaches c of f of x exists if each of the one-sided limits respectively exist and are the same. So, like, I mean, I guess it couldn't be the same thing if one of them didn't exist. But if the limit as x approaches c from the negative side of f of x is equal to the limit as x approaches c from the positive side of f of x, if they're the same number, let's just say that number is, is l, some real number. We're going to say that the limit of f of x is equal to l. So what does this look like? Normally, I would be uh, I would be standing up in front of you, and I'd be like using my fingers to trace along the graph, and I'd say like your fingers need to be going towards each other. But I don't have my face camera on right now, so like yeah, I can't show you that. Really, what we need is we need to be approaching one value from the the left in order for the limit to exist, and be approaching the same value from the right. Okay, and we have a couple of options for this limit to exist. Uh, it could either, you know, that, or it could just be a nice, smooth, continuous function, and, okay, then the limit exists there, okay? But if we have a jump discontinuity, as you'll see later, that's going to be, that's going to be a limit non-existing situation. So, if we say that the limit as x approaches a number of f of x exists only when the two one-sided limits are equal, if I go back up here and was to ask you about, oops, uh, ask you about the limit as x approaches 1 of f of x. Well, when we do that, we're going to be considering the limit from the left and the limit from the right. Okay, You see 2 and 5, not the same number. 
since they both exist but they don't agree, I'm going to say that this limit does not exist, and I'm going to abbreviate it using D and E. Okay? And because I'm going to give you a reason, the limit from the left as x approaches 1 from the left of f of x is, well, it's not equal to the limit as x approaches 1 from the positive side of f of x. That's the real reason for the limit non-existence. But again, I'll, I'll just tell you more about that. All right, so let's uh, let's work on an example here. So we're just kind of uh, confronted with a couple of limits and a couple of questions about the value of the function. Let's start with the value of the function. That's always the easiest, right? So I'm going to start with f of 4. Let's, let's figure out what f of 4 is. Maybe I'll do something about it. f of 4 is going to be right there, you know? It's just going to be, what is the, the height of the graph? Well, I don't see any other filled in places except for right there at 1. So I'm going to say that f of 4 is equal to 1. Okay, f of 7, I'm looking for the dot. That's going to be right there. It's on the x-axis. That means that y is equal to 0. So yeah, that's the easy part. Okay, now the limit of f of x as x approaches 4. Okay, the idea here is that, I think I just drew this picture earlier, but we need to consider the one-sided limits. As x approaches 4 from the negative side, like that, what's happening on the graph? We're approaching negative 2. Then, as we approach 4 from the positive side, we're going to be approaching negative 2 again, which means that both of the one-sided limits exist, and they equal negative 2, which means that the limit of f of x as x approaches 4 is equal to negative 2. But on the other hand, at x equals 7, well, we just are not seeing the same thing. We're seeing a, a break in the graph. From one side, you know, this one's going to do this not existing for the same reason as, as we Namely because, you know, over here, the limit as x approaches 7 from the negative side of f of x equals 0. And the limit as x approaches 7 from the positive side of f of x is going to be 4, right? If we're approaching from that way, we're getting closer and closer to that circle, which is at y equals 4. And 0 and 4 are not the same number, right? So we've got disagreement in one-sided limits means the limit doesn't exist. All right, now here is a function, I don't know, maybe you studied these types of functions, these rational functions in a previous math class. But oftentimes in the, you know, our pre-calculus classes, we kind of get lost in the weeds on these rational functions, and we end up graphing ones that are way too complicated. Most of the ones that we see in this class, they involve some canceling, and they're, they're not too high of degree. It's not like fifth degree or fifth degree where two of the factors cancel, and, you know, you're left with some, some crazy stuff. That's not going to happen, hopefully. Yeah, within reason. I know what's going to happen in AP calculus, and this is not going to happen. So the first thing we're going to do, like often, is factor, right? So I'm going to say that f of x is equal to, let's see, x minus 5 times x plus 4 over x minus 5. Okay. And all right. Well, this is going to be, I can cancel these things just as long as I'm not canceling 0 divided by 0, because we know 0 divided by 0 is not a real number. Um, this is equal to x plus 4, um, just as long as x is not equal to 5. Well, I know how to graph y equals x plus 4, right? Like, y equals mx plus b, that's great. 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay, it's everywhere except for x equals 5, y equals x plus 4, which, if we think about what that means, we can get really close to it, and that's really what we're saying when we draw one of those open circles, right? And maybe you remember from that class that if you can cancel factors, that's what causes a hole in the graph. Okay? Now this means, you know, you can, when finding f of 5, on one hand, you could just kind of like start at x equals 5 and look up and be like, I don't see any graph. But on the other hand, you could say, well, f of 5 is going to be, I'm going to say that's 5 squared is 25 minus 5 minus 20 divide by 5 minus 5. That's 0 over 0. Again, you know 0 over 0 is not a real number. Okay? It's not 1. It's not 0. It's not, it's not anything. It's not defined. 
So that's why, you know, when we plug that in, it's undefined. We can't plug in 5 plus 4 and get 9, right? 0 over 0. 0 over 0 is not equal to 9. But f of x, as x is approaching 5, is certainly approaching 9, right? All right, that's what we're seeing right there uh, from both sides. If you could see me, you would see my fingers, you know, kind of going like this, you know, towards each other, towards the same spot. Okay, that's what it looks like for a limit to exist. Okay. Now, now we're going to sketch the graph of y, of y equals absolute value x divided by x. And this is a really nice function. It kind of comes back repeatedly in the course. Uh, but this is kind of just your first introduction to it. Um, and one thing I need to tell you is that as long as you are graphing functions on a two-dimensional window, right, on the xy plane, this thing where you're going to take x's and plug them into the function, plot the points and connect the dots, it still works. It's always going to be a valid strategy. Okay? It might take a while, but it's, it's never the wrong, you know, just the wrong thing to do if you're trying to make an accurate graph. And this is something we have no idea what it is, so this, this is the thing to do. All right. So let's look at x equals 2 and x equals 3. Well, if I take the absolute value of 2, that's 2, and I divide by 2, and that's 1. If I do that for 3, it's going to be the exact same thing, right? And really, for any positive value of x, the absolute value doesn't affect it. So I'm dividing it by itself, which means I'm getting 1. So anytime x is positive, y is going to be 1. Okay. Now, zero, I just got finished reminding you of something that you already knew, is that zero divided by zero is not a real number. So if I plug this in, I'm going to get zero divided by zero. Right? And so I'm going to just say that this is undefined, does not exist, whatever kind of language you want to use, it's fine. But then I'm going to look at you know, negative numbers. What's going to happen when x is negative? Well, for example, say negative 7. I take the absolute value of negative 7 and I get 7. But then I divide by negative 7. I take 7 divided by negative 7. You take a number, you divide it by the negative version of itself, you're going to get negative 1. So that's where I'm going to have negative 1 down here like that. Okay, And like I said, at 0, the function doesn't exist. So that's where we need to put open circles at both of these levels. And that's the graph of y equals absolute value of x divided by x. And that's, that's a function that we're going to come into contact with uh, a few times throughout this year. All right, now let's talk about reasons for limit non-existence. Okay, I've already kind of told you about one of them. You know, one of them is, you know, the two one-sided limits exist, but they don't agree. Okay, um, so I'm going to call that one-sided limits disagree. That is a sentence, but I'm just Okay, what does that look like? That looks like a jump discontinuity. And maybe that one's filled in and that one's open. Okay, something like that. There's a break in the graph, right? From the left, I am approaching something that is definitely less than what I'm approaching when I come from the right. Okay, that's one reason for limit non-existence. Then there's some sort of infinity-related situation, which I will just, in general, call unbounded behavior. And this is basically, you know, like a vertical asymptote. And we'll talk a whole lot more about this next time. Next time, if you see something like this, we'll probably say that the limit is infinity, positive infinity. Um, but that's, you know, again, for now, where we're saying the limit exists and equals a real number, uh, you know, if it's approaching infinity, infinity is also not a real number. So um, that's a reason for limit non-existence. And the third one is really, really um, kind of obscure, not, not super important to the course, um, and that would be oscillation. Okay, um, and that's just where the function is just wiggling back and forth, then you can't really tell what it's doing, okay? So, and I know I really haven't defined this yet, um, but the limit as x approaches infinity of, like, sine x or cosine x, you know what happens, it just goes up and down and up and down repeatedly, right? As, you know, it just keeps on. Bigger x gets, 
where it keeps going back and forth. It's not approaching one singular value, which means that doesn't exist because it's oscillating back and forth between negative one and one. But then there's also the graph of y equals the sine of one over x. Okay. And that, I'm going to attempt to draw a picture of this for you, but, you know, it's probably not going to be the best thing ever. It looks like it's going to go all right. What happens when you do sine of 1 over x is that it really bunches up the waves up near the, up near the y-axis. And if you have a calculator, I mean, graph this thing and zoom in on the origin and see what happens. The closer you look, the noisier it gets. And then if you think more about what happens when you replace a x in a function with 1 over x, you'll kind of see what's going on. It's just bouncing back and forth. The closer you get to zero, the more it's oscillating between negative one and one. And that's the solution. But you shouldn't see that happen very often, if at all, in this class. But it is a reason that a limit would not exist. Okay. Now, the linearity of limits. This is one of those things that it's like, you're going to be like, dude, like, obviously. Like, how could it not? But this is not, um, I mean, it's not the most complicated thing in calculus, but it is the type of thing that we need to use this property, this linearity of limits, to prove lots of other theorems in the class. So it's important that I tell you. So basically what it's saying is if we know the limits of f and g, and a and b are constants, then pretty much the limit of the sum is the sum of the limits, and you know, multiplying by a constant works the way you expect. So I'm going to just, uh, I'm going to copy it down. I'm going to pause the recording real quick. All right, so in its most general sense, the limit as x approaches c, if we already know those limits in the first place, of a f plus b g is a times the limit of f plus b times the limit of g, right? So over here, if I'm asked to, I'm given the limit of g and the limit of h, and I'm asked to find the limit of 3g minus 2h, they're going to be really friendly to us, okay? This is going to be equal to, 3 times the limit of g, well, they said the limit of g was negative 2, minus 2 times the limit of h, which is 7. Okay, so it's going to be negative 6 minus 14 is negative 20. Okay. We should all be so lucky to see an AP calculus question like that. Okay, now if the question I'm going to leave you with, and this is kind of a question that um, is going to be answered later in class, I think, um, is that if we have a function whose limit as x approaches 3 is 5, if I transform it a certain way, is that going to preserve the, the limit statement? And I want you to think about that, and if you're curious about it, come talk to me before class next time, and that's, that's something that we might have a good discussion on. But other than that, that's all I got for you. Um, definitely make sure to work those practice problems, and uh, come see me if you need it.